<laughs> so today we're uh, really diving into some deep stuff with Michelle Serres' hominescence. We're going to be talking about, you know, the future of being human, the role of all this technology, and even, get this, the definition of death itself. You know, what really gets me about Serres is how he just jumps right into these huge questions. Like, he doesn't tiptoe around it. He dives right into these kind of unsettling, almost unthinkable ideas. Yeah. Like, for example, the four deaths. Yeah. it's a, It makes you stop and think when he lays it all out like that. I mean, there's individual death, right? Sadly, we all know about that one. But then, Sarah's, he takes it like a step further. He goes beyond. Yeah. The death of entire societies, cultures, just not vanishing. Right. And then it's like, zoom out even further. The death of a whole species. Dinosaurs, gone. But then that final death, that's the one that really messes with you. The death of death itself. It's this concept that with all our technological advancements, especially in life extension, death, well, it could become a choice. Imagine a future where death isn't this inevitable end, but an option. It completely changes like everything, right? Our understanding of life, our purpose, even our place in the universe. I mean, it sounds like something out of sci-fi, but then you think, what if he's onto something? Like, what if that's really where we're heading? It makes you think about how you're living your life right now, you know? It's wild. We're living longer than ever, pushing the limits of lifespan, but at the same time, everywhere you look, there's death. News, movies, it's like we're surrounded. It's this strange paradox that Sarah's, he nails it. You know, we're in this weird in-between pushing death away with one hand and then grabbing onto it with the other. And he argues that this distance from death, this shift from a time when like suffering and dying young were just part of life, it actually makes it harder for us to even relate to the past. It's like you can read about it in history books, but can we really understand the struggles, the triumphs of the people who came before us? Our whole relationship with suffering, it's just different. People say history repeats itself. But can we really learn from it if we can't truly grasp what those people went through? It's a big question. And it goes right to the core of Sarah's idea of Homo Universalis. He argues that with technology, humanity has become this insanely powerful force. We're shaping the planet, even our own evolution. We eradicated smallpox. We're messing with genes. We're not just along for the ride with natural selection anymore. We're in the driver's seat. Whoa. It's true. It's like we've become the masters of our own biological destiny in a way. Right. Which brings us to Sarah's idea of this like new symbiosis. So <laughs> instead of natural selection just doing its thing, we have technology like vaccines partnering with us in this fight to survive. It makes you wonder, though, are we ready for this level of control? What are the ethics of all this power? And that is where it gets really interesting, you see, because Sarah's he's not afraid to look at the possible dangers of all this power. I mean, we've seen how technology can be used for good and for really bad things. So where does this lead us, having this much control over life and death? Man, that is a heavy question. And it all ties into how Sarah sees technology transforming not just our world out there, but ourselves, our bodies even. He's saying technology isn't just something we use. It's becoming a part of us. Yeah. And it's amplifying what we can do in ways we're just starting to wrap our heads around. Exactly. And he uses this term to tippetance. It's about our natural ability to adapt, to take on different roles. Think about your hand, right? You can grip a tool, play an instrument, write a novel. It's incredibly versatile. Mm. And Sarah's saying that technology, it takes that versatility to like a whole other level. Mm. It's like our smartphone, they're like external brains now, right? Yeah. We store memories, connect with people, process information, all through these little devices. It's freeing in a way, but it makes you think, how is this constant connection actually shaping our brains, like changing how we think? It really is like we're taking pieces of our brains and putting them in the cloud. Yeah. So Reese, he talks about this shift, right, from knowledge being this thing that's localized, like tied to our physical experiences, to this massive web of information. Yeah, it's like the Internet is becoming this like external hard drive for humanity. Exactly. And that's, I don't know, exciting and kind of scary at the same time. On the one hand, you've got almost unlimited information all right there at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, it makes you wonder about like the long game. If right. we aren't really engaging with the information, if we're just passively taking it in, does that change how we learn and remember things? I think so, yeah. So, like our brains get used to just, oh, Google can tell me that. Right. Why bother remembering? But then what happens when it's just too much? 
information overload. That's another thing Sarah talks about. Yeah, the potential downsides of this information explosion. Oh, totally. He talks about that feeling of being overwhelmed, like drowning in data and trying to figure out what even matters. Yeah, it's like drinking from a fire hose. And and it's not just knowledge that's changing. Sears, he also talks about how technology is messing with our perception of time and space. He says we're witnessing the end of domestication. Uh And not just for, like, animals, but for humans, too. It's really interesting when he talks about how technology, especially the Internet, creates this non-place. Oh, yeah. It's a space where all those traditional boundaries, you know, like where you are, what time it is, even what laws apply, they all get blurry. Yeah, it's true. We could talk to someone across the world, like they're right here, work from a beach, experience different cultures without even like leaving our living room. It's true. It's like we're untethered from the physical world in a way that, I don't know, people could only dream of before. It's freeing, but then you wonder about the, like, what are the consequences, you know? Are we getting so used to this digital world that we're losing touch with the real one, with our physical surroundings, the people around us even? It's definitely a balancing act. Mm -hmm. Sears doesn't say he has all the answers, but he does talk about how important it is to find that balance. Yeah. He talks about this paradox of, you know, feeling super connected online, but then feeling really isolated in our actual lives. It's something a lot of us are dealing with, I think. Yeah, it's like we want those real connections, but... We're so used to screens, we're forgetting how to do it face-to-face. We've become tourists in our own lives, like, just observing instead of really participating. And and speaking of paradoxes, Sarah's points out this really interesting one about peace. Okay. He says that the relative peace we have now in a lot of the world is actually because of the possibility of total destruction. Like Hiroshima. Exactly. And it's kind of a scary thought, but it makes you think, right? It does. It's like the possibility of just, like total annihilation it's forced us to figure out other ways to deal with conflict when the stakes are that high going to war it's unthinkable so we have to find other solutions through diplomacy cooperation but here's the paradox even with this like longer period of peace we still seem drawn to violence especially in the media it's like we're grossed out by it but also can't look away Why do you think that is? Well, it's a question philosophers have been wrestling with forever. Sayers, he sees it as almost a morbid curiosity. Like it's part of what makes us human, right? Yeah. Compassion and cruelty, we're capable of both. And the media, well, they know how to use that, you know? Mm -hmm. Sensationalizing violence and conflict to make money, entertain people. It's true. We can't look away even though we know it's awful. So it makes you wonder, are we truly at peace? Or are we just really good at ignoring suffering if it's not happening to us directly? That's a good question. Sarah's doesn't claim to have all the answers, but he definitely wants us to confront these hard truths about ourselves and the world. It's weird, right? Like, we're so connected globally, but are we really dealing with these big global issues? Or are we just kind of hitting, like, and moving on? Sarah's he ties all this back to this idea of, like, A new humanism. Yeah. And it all comes back to how technology is changing, how we deal with knowledge. He talks about this shift from, you know, knowledge being localized, like in our bodies, our experiences, to this global, like, digital network of knowing. Right. He uses the Internet as an example. Like, Mm -hmm. it's this external memory bank. Oh, yeah. Where we're all constantly sharing and reshaping information. Like, we're all plugged into this this global mind, almost. It's kind of mind-blowing when you put it that way. So, if our brains are like, these nodes in this giant network, does that change what it even means to know something? That's a good question. Like, is it less about what's in our own heads and more about how we access information together as a group? That's really what Sears is getting at, yeah. He thinks that by... You know, moving some of these mental tasks, like remembering outside of ourselves and relying more on these external memory banks, these networks, it actually frees up our minds for other things. Okay. So like, like creativity, critical thinking, even deeper understanding. He sees it as this potential evolution of like human consciousness, not a loss. So it's not just about having all the answers a click away. Right. It's about using all that knowledge to like, Solve problems, connect with each other, push the limits of what we think is possible even. Yeah, exactly. It's exciting, but also kind of a heavy responsibility. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And Sarah's he doesn't shy away from that. Mm. He talks about how important it is that we use this power wisely, that we're like actively shaping our future, not just letting it happen to us. He wants us to move away from what he calls um, homo terminator, you know, mm. that destructive side of humanity driven by power and greed. Right. 
and move towards a more compassionate, interconnected future. So how do we actually do that? How do we like embrace this new way of being connected without falling into the the bad stuff that technology can bring? Well, Sarah says it starts with like a change in how we see things. Okay. Being willing to accept uncertainty, you know, yeah. to really question what we think it means to be human in this like super technological world. He's calling for a new kind of humanism. Okay. One that gets how connected we all are and our responsibility to each other, to the planet even. Mm. So it's like looking beyond just ourselves, mm -hmm. our own needs and wants. Right. And seeing ourselves as part of something much bigger. Yeah. And being open to what we don't know, but doing it responsibly, knowing that what we do affects everything around us. That's it. Yeah, that's the core of what Sarah is saying. It's like a call to action, you know, yeah. to step into this new world with open minds. Yeah. And this commitment to creating a future that works for everyone. To remember that the future isn't something that just happens. We build it through the choices we make every single day. So as we kind of wrap up this deep dive into hominescence, yeah. I think the biggest thing to take away is this. The future is not set in stone. It's a work in progress, and we're all adding to it. And the question Sarah is asking us, I think, is what kind of future are you going to help build? Right. Will you embrace the power of technology without losing your humanity, your compassion, your sense of wonder even? Yeah. Will you use your voice, your actions, to shape a future that is fair and just and sustainable for everybody? Those are questions we've all got to think about. Because what we choose to do today, that's what's going to decide the future for all of us. Yeah. So keep asking questions. Keep digging into the ideas that challenge you and inspire you. Yeah. Keep learning. Keep diving deep.